Good afternoon, everyone here in the room or elsewhere watching in Washington, D.C. Um, and good morning to what I hope are many people watching along as well in Papua New Guinea, Australia, and elsewhere. For those here in the room, that's why we're doing this as late in the afternoon as possible, so hopefully we have some friends online um, um, in the region. My name is Brian Harding, and I'm the senior expert for Southeast Asia and the Pacific Islands here at the U.S. Institute of Peace. USIP is a national, nonpartisan public institution that was created by the U.S. Congress, headquartered here on the National Mall in Washington, D.C., and we have a very clear mandate, and it's to prevent, mitigate, and resolve violent conflict abroad. USIP is pr present, in addition to this beautiful building here, in about 26 countries around the world, in, around the world and one of them is Papua New Guinea, where we have one of our newest country programs. The context for it and the development of our program in Papua New Guinea is a really uh, a major expansion of the Institute's work in the Indo-Pacific region, including the Pacific Islands. And of course, this is in line with growing attention in Washington and by the US government. Uh, last week at USIP, we had an event with some of the most senior officials for the Indo-Pacific in the US government, uh, sort of celebrating the second anniversary of the Indo-Pacific strategy that the White House released. And you know, really one of the big takeaways was the relative increase in attention to the Pacific Islands region. Um, and it's really been remarkable. For USIP, Papua New Guinea has really become a center of gravity for us in the Pacific Islands as we've developed this broader program. Um, certainly the geopolitical Im uh, importance of Papua New Guinea in the region um, is, is a part of that driver, but also, you know, we have to be honest, it's a country that's racked with conflict, uh, so a natural place for USIP to be engaged. In terms of what we are actually doing, I'll take the moment to do the advertisement. Uh, first thing I'd say is all of our work in Papua New Guinea is new. We've only been there for about a year. Uh, but I also think it's a reflection of the wide range of the type of work we do at USIP. Um, at headquarters, we're engaged in research on conflict dynamics in the country um, and also supporting efforts to build a closer U.S.-Papua New Guinea relationship. In Port Moresby, we're fostering dialogue between diverse national actors on peace and conflict largely through a partnership with the National Research Institute. And at the community level, primarily in Morobe province, but also elsewhere, we're piloted, piloting some very practical strategies to try to, try to prevent violence. Um, today we're here to talk about a recent wave of violence in Papua New Guinea that's really hit the international headlines, and which I think is a real stark reminder of the challenges the country faces, but also the challenges and opportunities in some ways uh, for the United States as it engages Papua New Guinea more and more. And I'm pleased that we're able to have, and at least for the moment, a stable internet connection to have two of our, our most important colleagues from USIP who are based in Papua New Guinea um, on the screen here. Um, and the two of them who I'll introduce in a moment have really uh, been my tutor over the last year or so as, as I've personally learned, learned more about the country. Um, and also Gordon Peak here is sitting next to me. Um, first, just to introduce them, Ruth Kissam, who is, at least on my left on, on the screen up there, is USIP's senior staff member in Port Moresby, the capital. Uh, Ruth is, however, from Enga province in the Highlands, uh, where she travels frequently. So unfortunately, it also means she's personally connected to the horrendous violence we've seen most recently. Um, and if you spend any time with Ruth in Port Moresby, you'll, you'll see very quickly how, how a dynamic individual she is who seamlessly moves between the different worlds that exist in Port Moresby and the country. We're, we're really pleased that she's with USIP and able to join us this morning. The second speaker is um, to the right, uh, who, is, who is static for a moment, but, we'll, but um, oh, no, she's moving, she's there. Uh, Zuabe Tinning. Um, uh, Zuabe uh, is our other senior staff member for USIP in Papua New Guinea, and she lives in Ley City in Morobe province. And Zuabe does some really extraordinary work at a community level that we're going to hear more about later on. And finally, sitting next to me here at headquarters is Gordon Peak, who's our senior advisor for the Pacific Islands. Gordon has long experience, decades of experience in Papua New Guinea, including over three years living in Bougainville, a topic on which he's written a book. Uh, and uh, among other things, he really s oversees our research agenda on the Pacific Islands um, and Papua New Guinea. So for our event today, we have a pretty generous amount of time, another 80 minutes or so. So what I'm going to do is give the floor in succession to Ruth, 
Zuabe and Gordon some, for some initial comments, hopefully about six or eight minutes, and then I'll ask a few questions, and then we'll open it up for a discussion, questions and comments in the room. Um, and those watching online, you can submit them online. Uh, and for those in the room, if you just take a look around, these are the people who follow Papua New Guinea in a serious way in Washington, so comments are just as welcome as questions. Um, but let me, without further ado, turn to Ruth. And Ruth, um, let's start with the basics. Uh, tell us what happened about a month or so ago in Port Moresby and how it relates to the more recent events up in the Highlands. Over to Ruth. You look stable and hopefully uh, the connection is good. Yes. Uh, good morning, Brian. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm in Port Moresby. I had to move to a early in the morning to a hotel so that I can uh, at least get a better network. And that's a funny thing about the island. Sometimes we have a funny network. Sometimes we are able to actually speak like the way that um, pick up the network, pick up the way it is picking up now. Um, about a month ago, it wasn't something that wasn't expected. We've had different um, scenarios where something the government does, all the people it would it would spiral into a bit of looting, a bit of rioting. Uh, but on 10th of January, it was actually the police that gave the orders for people uh, because they were not happy with the government uh, on the ta uh, uh, the tax cuts that they they were they felt they it was imposed on them. Uh, the government la later retracted and said that it was actually a glitch uh, with the Internal Revenue Com Commission. And it wasn't really a, a tax cut, but we know that it was a tax cut. And they had to say that to cover up for um, their lack of, of foresight into seeing what this was going to turn out to be. I work with a lot of community um, leaders across the city. We run safe houses. We work with women and vulnerable and marginalized uh, young people. But what we saw was not only the ones that were marginalized that went out and did the looting. It was the public servants. Uh, it was also the working class. It was people that you would think would not even um, drive the vehicle up into shops and um, actually help themselves to the looting. Uh, that really showed something that in a lot of cases we refused to see, which was um, there was no state. There was no uh, state in place that people would respect and say that we have a rule of law or even for people themselves to say that uh, it's morally wrong. What we saw was it was people were just driven by uh, a mindset of poverty that they wanted to at least get anything they want. Now, one of the funny things that we also realized was this, there were certain shops that were not even touched. Uh, they were, and I'll link this to what happened in the islands. There were certain shops that were not touched. Most of the shops that were um, looted were those that have been in the country for a very long time, but they belong to a specific ethnicity. Um, one was the stop and shop, uh, which is uh, Indian, Fijian that has been in Papua New Guinea for a very long time, 30 years. The other one was um, an Australian um, who came back in the 60s, Brian Bell. And he's been, and he's both of them are foundations that have been working in communities. One would think these were two shops that no one would even bother touching because um, these are the ones that work with community. These are the ones that work with civil society, with the government, and have been around for a very long time, faithfully paying their taxes. Um, but no, they were the first ones to be looted. But what we saw was some particular shops, Chinese shops, shops on the periphery where you would think would be the first to be touched. They were not touched. Now they had people protecting those places, gunmen protecting those places, uh, the premises where people couldn't get in and even loot them because they knew that those places were guarded. They knew that these places had guns that were protecting them. So no one bothered to touch those Chinatowns. Uh, no one bothered to touch those shops, but they went after the shops that was it belonged to just about everyone in the community. Now, um, with after the aftermath, uh, the aftermath saw a lot of Papua New Guineans struggling, especially within the city. Uh, I'm sure Zuabe will talk about what happened in Lee, but with us, we saw in our safe houses, women, uh, that were raped inside the shops that were looted, uh, that were killed inside the shops that were looted. 
we've asked people to come forward, but we don't know the exact number as of now, even though the government has set up a commission, uh, which doesn't include women on, on the board, it's all men, uh, to find out about what happened on that day. And that is something that we feel women's voices have also not been taken into consideration, given the fact that um, a lot of the shopkeepers that were inside those shops that got burned down uh, and those that lost their lives were women. And yet we don't have the numbers that have come out. Some are saying it's in the hundreds, uh, but what to what extent and the exact number, we still don't know. Even to this day, the, the reports have not been filed and tabled uh, for the public to, to, uh, to access. And so we're now at a juncture where we don't know what happened, um, um, exactly what happened, what triggered January 10th, uh, as far as the government is concerned. But um, on the streets, we know that uh, the government does know what happened. Um, they're fully aware of it. And um, and they don't want to even take that into consideration, given the fact that we have a uh, voice of no confidence coming up. Uh, so I, I don't know, Brian, if I could link that to Enga, or we can do that later. Go on, let's do that. Okay. So what we saw in Enga uh, was again, um, a gun violence on the level that was never seen before. And this is a month later from what happened in Moresby. And, and Ruth, I, I think the audience here is pretty familiar with Port Moresby. Can you just take a step back and just tell us where Enga is, what it is, who lives there, and, and just some of those those broader dynamics? Absolutely. So Enga is one of the highlands, um, seven highlands provinces, smack right in the middle of the, and I think it's the highest elevation, and it's right in the middle of, of the whole island of Papua New Guinea. Um, it hosts the Pogoro mine. Uh, it's one of the few provinces um, that I think made contact with the outside world very late, probably in the 50s, 40, 50s, yeah. So it's it's tribal in every way, very, and the people who live there are quite aggressive. Um, they solve their to them, peace building is actually taking it out on the battlefield with their um, tribal enemies. Uh, lately, we've had lots and lots of guns smuggled into the province. Um, and a lot of these guns are smuggled in for elections. <clears throat> every five years, we have our elections. And every year, um, it has changed its course. It used to be when we, we stand in line and then we vote. But lately, for the last three or four elections, it's been what they call a block vote because of the tribal way in people think um, the tribe agrees to give to one. So it is their form of democracy is when a tribe actually gives to one person. And um, and if two people from one tribe are actually running for the same seat, that's where you find conflict. So there, there's been the buildup of arms uh, by aspiring politicians, by businessmen to protect their business. It's just people have been doing that. Uh, what we saw on Sunday um, last week, was something at a scale that we've never seen. We've always had rules of engagement when it came to tribal warfare. You don't kill two men from the same family in one uh, warfare. I'm an Engen. I'm, I'm about three hours drive from, uh, my village is three hours drive from where the killings happened. We don't kill uh, women and children. We don't um, burn people within the house. You only engage with your enemies at the tribal field. Those are the rules of engagement. But what, what happened on Sunday was something at a scale um, culturally, did not have any roots. 50 plus men were killed and they were ambushed. Now, another thing that came up that um, we're starting to realize is usually because of bullets and bullets not being readily available, people don't use machine guns like, um, or, or guns like AK-47 or this SLR, but that was what was used and people sprayed into the crowd of men that came uh, which meant there was so many bullets available. Now, the question that many are asking is where did those bullets come from? Um, where did those guns come uh, The guns have been there. They've been trading those guns, but it's the bullets that usually runs out. Um, and we've seen how the networking has happened within, whether it's um, from different people finding those. Uh, remember my my insinuation earlier about certain business houses not being touched in Mosby. Now, this, the, the, we're looking back and we're seeing that there is some form of connection between how those guns, those bullets are actually being moved between places that are the entry ports and up into these islands. Now, if you see Enga province is smacked right in the middle of Papua New Guinea. 
So the only way in and the only way out is the main highway or the airports that are closer to the province. So the bullets that are coming in, into the province, um, it's leading to a question that uh, it's beyond Papua New Guinea itself and the capacity for them to be able, especially the defense force or the army, which are the two, the armories that uh, we have bullets available. So again, we're looking at the borders, we're looking at, and this is the work that I do with um, the different organizations that we work with where it looks at um, um, human trafficking, uh, gun smuggling, uh, even um, human rights abuses that are happening. What happened in Wabeg or Enga at, on that day as a direct link to how those guns and the bullets are coming into the, the island. And of course, we've got at the moment uh, a big issue around drugs as well where PNG is now being used as a port to be able to smuggle drugs. Uh, so those guns and the bullets, it's not manufactured in Papua New Guinea. So there has got to be a way that it's coming in and falling into the hands of the warlord who are abusing it and using it for tribal um, reason in their tribal fights. And it's wiping people out, causing massacre that has never been seen before on that kind of scale. Great. Thanks, Ruth. And there's so much to come back to. And you, you can't see from where you're sitting, but many of the people who are thinking most deeply about Papua New Guinea in Washington are writing down many notes about what you're saying. So much to get, get back to. Um, Zuabe, I'm hoping you can go take us back to the riots and, and take us to, to Lay. Um, certainly there was violence, but and seven people were killed at the same time as these riots were ongoing in Port Moresby. But at least, you know, reading the headlines and sort of trying to watch the news, it seemed like there was less generalized looting and mayhem. And Zuaba, you work directly with exactly the type of people who might be involved in such violence. So we're hoping you can just share what those days look like in Lay, who was involved, who wasn't, and any lessons that, that you might have taken from it. Thank you, Brian, and hello, everybody. Um, yes, usually when um, riots or like, rampage, anything like that that happens in Port Mosby, the rippling effect usually comes out to the other smaller centers in the country. And Lay is one of the cities that experienced a little bit of the riot. Um, there wasn't a lot of looting because um, all the discipline forces, meaning the police, the defense, and the correctional service officers, they were out on the street, manning the street and preventing people from looting shops and um, causing damage to properties around the um, city. So that was about Lay City. Even though we had 50 policemen that were flown down from um, Lay to Port Mosby to contain the situation in Port Mosby, we had the other two disciplined forces that joined the police and they were on the streets maintaining order. Um, what happened a, a little bit atem of you know breaking shops and all this, it happened outside of the main city up at um, Uni, Unitech and um, around the four mile area. But um, the shops was, went um, looted because um, there were police presence there too. And just like Ruth said, those Asian shop had to you know, maybe pay for police to be around and keep their shops safe from looting. But um, what I was interested in during that time, because most of the time when such thing happened in Port Mosby, um, the youths in Lay usually get out on the street and they, they do a lot of damage to the properties and cause a lot of trouble on the streets. But during that time, we didn't have that. We only had a little bit of unrest, just like half a day, and everything went back normal the next day. So I, um, there went a lot of people um, injured. They, were, they said there were about two to seven who were killed during the, that um, half day riot, but um, numbers are not really confirmed yet. The youths were interviewed later that week uh, on um, what they were doing during that um, week of um, unrest. And the youths that I, I was working with, they are usually from the outskirts of Lay City in the settlements where 
most of the you know illegal activities are um evident most of them they go into violence and they they they, they usually be the first people to participate in um rioting and looting of shops they didn't come out their time so i asked them why um what they were doing during their time and they said it's nothing to do with us it's it's um it's the public servants issues it's about the them paying tax to the government we are from the community and we live on you know market table market and we need the shops and the market um, in the communities to be open so we can continue to do our business and survive from what we are doing here. So um, the youths didn't come out. They saw the situation as um, something that belongs to the public servants who, who usually pay tax to the government. For them, they only do informal marketing, so um, they don't pay tax. And they said it doesn't affect us, so we don't need to get out there and do something nasty and get ourselves into trouble. So those were the responses that we I received from the um, the youth leaders that I were um, engaged in my program here in Morobe Province. Great, thank you, Zuabe. And just broader context, I mean, some people in this room know you and know about your work. Um, Zuabe, she can explain it better than I, but works with um, male young male perpetrators perpetrators of violence who are sort of check themselves into faith-based self-help organizations. And Zoabe works with them in a really sophisticated ways to think about masculinity and try to get out the, the root causes of violence. So I think there's a lot to follow up there. She truly is in the community about where she works, where she chooses to live. Um, so, so I think there's a lot, lot to be gained from there. And we'll, we'll get back to Zoabe in a moment. But I want to turn it to, to Gordon. Um, you know, you've written, and, and I think pretty boldly, um, that the violence, and maybe that's what you can do as a, uh, somebody from Ireland who's in the mix of thinking about issues in Papua New Guinea and U.S. Papua New Guinea relations, Australia Papua New Guinea relations, but you've written about the what you say are the failings, the governance failings of the Papua New Guinea state, and I'm hoping you can talk us a little bit through about what you you've written um, and a bit on what um, you know the world's focus on Papua New Guinea might. Uh, you know, mean for thinking about the responsiveness uh, of the state. And I know you have some other, other writings related to policing, but let's let's get to this first bit first. Great. Yeah, I mean, I, I think maybe it is partly from coming from Ireland, but also I was taught as a writer to write what's in front of you, to write what you're actually seeing. Um, and I think really Ruth captured it well when she said that the events of, of 10th of January showed that the state was not there. And sometimes that we can kind of, we see uh, a state in Papua New Guinea that actually when you look behind it is about as substantive as a kind of movie set in a way. Um, one of the most iconic sets of footage of the, of the riots was a, was sort of footage that was taken from the office of the prime minister and, and cabinet of Papua New Guinea where there were people kind of shaking at the gate trying to get in and the gate managed to hold only because there was one little lock that managed to keep it um, from, from people storming it as well. And I can vividly, I spent a lot of time in, in that office and one of the most, and I, I traveled with some USIP colleagues there, uh, including Zwabe last February. And I remember the most, my most abiding memory of being in those offices is how few people there are in the offices. They look rather grand from the outside, but when you look inside, there's very few people there at their desk sort of uh, working. And I think this is the sort of dilemma of, of governance in, in Papua New Guinea, that you have a state that is being, a lot is expected of it, but actually when you look behind it, it's not, um, it's not doing particularly very much. And geopolitics that you mentioned, Brian, earlier on, I think sort of amplifies that, uh, that, that, sta that situation and also exposes, I think, the dilemma that there is in anyone who is sort of wanting to engage with and wanting to work with, wanting to kind of support Papua New Guinea and the people of Papua New Guinea to, to address some of the, 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 the violence that my colleagues you know, have so eloquently described and work, on, and work on every day. And the dilemma is this, which is that states work on having productive relationships with other states. That's the nature of the state system. Um, states are meant to forge 
I mean, that's what the Vienna Convention, like that's the, the way by which states work. They're meant to forge productive relationships with other states. And that means forging productive relationships with the elites of other states. And as Sir Ruth has kind of alluded to, there's lots of questions about the elites in, uh, some elites certainly, in, in Papua New Guinea and their desire to actually kind of address this. Um, and I think this kind of gets into, you know, an issue that, you know, the U.S. has confronted, you know, and all states have confronted throughout their history of how do you work with other states, particularly when it comes to issues of fragility and stability and sort of aid and development, because there you're getting into tricky political issues and tricky issues that, that kind of put you in, you know, put the potential to have uncomfortable conversations with, uh, with, uh, with your kind of counterparts in, in, the political, in the political elite as well. And I think that's one of the sort of the dilemmas of, um, of this present moment for Papua New Guinea. I, mean, I write in the, in the piece that Papua New Guinean leaders are tremendous, as anyone who's visited Papua New Guinea knows Papua New Guineans are in general at, at rolling out the red carpet, rolling out the welcome mat for, for people but probably less good at the kind of work-a-day instances of, of governance that, um, that, that are kind of required to make the state run. There was a report that was done by the Australian National University about a decade ago, and it looked at the, um, the Papua New Guinea state's performance in health and education. And the, 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 the title of the report was really vivid. It was a lost decade, and the statistics for sort of health indicators, education indicators, um, have sort of flatlined in, in the decade, in the decade since. And I'll give one other example about the sort of the dilemmas that, and we, I wrote a piece on this that's on the USIP website, one of the dilemmas of sort of getting this, the Papua New Guinea state kind of working, um, getting it activated, and that's something that was announced by the previous administration um, in uh, APEC in 2018, Australia, uh, the U.S., Japan, New Zealand have have uh, embarked upon a really important, a really really vital, um, practical and geostrategically important uh, project to try to electrify the country. Where there's only 15 percent of the country is electrified. The reason why Ruth had to leave her home in the capital and go to a hotel is because she couldn't guarantee that there was electricity at home to be able to have this call. And yet when you look at some of the reports of that project, it sort of makes, let me see, I've got, you know, it talks about chronic crisis, it talks about general dysfunction. These are sort of quotes that we pulled out as, as well. And I think that sort of shows the dilemma that there is for, for any state wanting to work with Papua New Guinea, which is, is, is sort of that, that sort of that tension between Papua New Guinea's elites knowing that they're being courted geopolitically and the, the, the need to actually make the state of which they are part, the state of which they are head of, the, st um, the state that to, um, to kind of work for the people of Papua New Guinea. And you saw on January 10th just how it didn't, how it didn't work, this really expensively, extensively trained police withered away in large part. Um, so it's, uh, it's, I think it shows the sort of the, the difficult sort of point you are when we talk about fragility. So let's dig into that a little bit. Um, this question of policing, it's something you've worked quite a bit on, got your start in the Pacific Islands uh, region on, and, and as you said, you know, the police sort of faded away, and that's what Ruth said, and also just this broader question of, of security forces, um, you know, had, had some positive um, impacts in private security, um, as Ruth was discussing. So um, clearly the PNG police have been expensively and extensively trained, um, and there's gonna be an instinct to do more. So is a new approach required, or what, what do we do here? How should Washington be, be thinking about this? So I think that, I think it, there's a standard menu that is done for police reform, that it's been done ever since the kind of early days of the Cold War, and it's the idea that you train police, because you assume you, that you say that the major challenge for the police is some the lack of technical skills, and so they need training and they need equipment. And I think that is an important part of the equation. I don't think we should sort of throw that out, but it obscures that there's other 
factors that are going on as well, which means that if you're only going to address the technical matter with with policing, you're going to miss the um, you know miss big, the bigger picture with with that particular police organization or with other police organizations all through the world. So let's sort of run through some of the issues that there are um, with the Papua New Guinea um, police, which is you've got a very small number of officers. You've got about 6,000 officers for a country of, of at least 10 million in population, which is well, well below the kind of UN recommended number of one for every 300 uh, police. You've got an off, an, a, a constabulary that has a kind of mixed record um, as well, uh, the police commissioner of Papua New Guinea, David Manning, described the police as some, some of them were criminals in uniform. That's his words, not my. He was being sort of you know, bolder than me in, in saying that. Um, and there's a political economy uh, at play as well, where Papua New Guinea's elite don't seem to put sort of budgetary allocations into, into areas where, which seem to be of obvious obvious need, so to, to address the sort of corruption issues in the country where 7% of the GDP of the country is meant to exit um, the country as well. Now, so I don't think training alone is going to do, is going to, is going to really make a, an impact on those kind of systemic and structural issues. And in the piece that we wrote, we kind of made sort of three, you know, three points. Um, the first one was to, sort of, was to continue what we're doing. It's, Police are constantly being trained. It's in the kind of nature of police um, to do that. But second, to look at what that the fact that a, the majority of policing, as in the maintenance of order, the the is actually not being done by people in uniform, but by sort of the two of the colleagues that we have in, in front of us here, people who use their networks and connections uh, to to um, you know to help police and maintain order. Um, within their communities. There's, there's been a long list of uh, survey findings which find consistently time and again that when Papua New Guineans are, have the choice of going to someone for safety, security, and access to justice, they actually don't go to the uniformed police. They go to clan leaders, they go to religious leaders, they go to members of esteemed in the community like Ruth and Zwabe. So I think it's sort of for us, it's, it's, it's about kind of recognizing that there's a bunch of really interesting literature written about something called policing coalitions. How do you try to network together people so they can all work uh, together on, on that? And the final point I think about thinking about the, the police is, is sort of digging a little bit deeper into, into kind of the, into questions around elite capture, questions around the political economy that the police are working within. USIP did this before my time, I was in this room when it, when it was launched, this terrific report that looked at the kind of behind the uniform features of what happens in policing in Ukraine, our security sector more broadly in Ukraine, in Mexico, they did one in, in Egypt. And I think that will provide a kind of set of insights that will show that sort of training alone um, is, a, is a part of the equation, but it can't just be the only part of the equation. Uh, as well. Great. I'm going to turn to Ruth for one question, um, and then we'll turn it to those in the room. And I think if you're online, um, you can and put those there, and, and then they'll be read out to us, to me, and the and the panel. But Ruth, you know, I think it probably jumped out to many people sitting in the room here uh, that there are no women on this commission uh, investigating what happened. And I'm wondering if you just take us a bit broader and talk about the women, peace, and security dynamic in Papua New Guinea. I know you're part of some interesting, important conversations about a national action plan. Just sort of situate us in that, in that conversation. Absolutely. So the UN Charter 1325 um, for women, peace, and security, uh, we don't have a national action plan in the country. I think there's about 130 countries in the world uh, that do have a national action plan, but Papua New Guinea doesn't. And that is one of the things that um, we've we've pushed for at the civil society, uh, have been pushing for to have. The country needs one. We have uh, what we call the gender secretariat, um, but that is more to deal with um, issues within the country. Uh, that is now clearly showing up in every sector we're seeing. Um, 
even in, in, in the political arena, we only have three women in parliament. Uh, well, you have 50% of, you know, the population, not 50, but more than 50% of the population being, being women. Um, we've tried to have reserve seats, but that too has been kicked out of par parliament, which is basically um, predominantly men. But then we have some uh, champions, some males that have championed uh, the costs for women. But at the same time, because of, uh, I can't really put it, pack it down to deeply patriarchal values, but then, but the Highland is deeply patriarchal. Uh, traditionally, our the traditional norms are so de defined, and you see that across so many cross-cutting issues where women are concerned. One prime example is the the, the committee that was set up to investigate January tenth. Uh, not one even thought of including a woman. And you would think that women were very very affected, and they were. Lots of women shoppers were harassed, were abused, were, uh, they ended up at the emergency. We had to be at the emergency um, uh, department of the hospital to see women come in with knife wounds. And these are uh, hospital, uh, sorry, these are shopkeepers at the shops that were looted. Uh, women that were raped, that were sexually assaulted during the looting. Uh, and one would think that women would form part of the committee but not even one woman is sitting at the, the committee. So who gets to now be their voice? Who gets to understand what it's like to be a woman when it when the whole country or when the whole city went into a mayhem, uh, looting and rioting? So it's it's the clearly the undertone is there uh, of not taking a woman's voice seriously into account. Yesterday we just had a a, a press conference where all the women leaders from provinces came together to appeal to the prime minister, to appeal to the members of the parliament, to appeal to the leaders that we don't care which side of the, the political spectrum you sit from, whether it is from the opposition or the government. As mothers, as women, uh, we're, we've had enough of violence. We have enough of, of mayhem. So it's, it's a cry not for any um, political sort of grandstanding but for genuine help for women who are suffering uh, because of all the gaps in our state. Uh, Gordon alluded to this, there is no state. And for that, where, where there are gaps where the, the state is weak, you're seeing a, a sort of um, a caricature of what you would think would look like. And that is supporting only a minority few and people abusing that, uh, they're coming up with ways in which to enrich and empower themselves at the cost of the state. And where there is, it's so weak, uh, it's being abused outright. We don't have strong laws that, or even um, legislation that would give uh, an opportunity for women to have uh, a seat in parliament, for example, which is something that they've been pushing for, that has been pushed back. Uh, but then at the same time, it's not making it easy for women to participate politically because, again, you have to stand in line. Now, which women would want to go and amass guns and money to push their way into parliament, to pay their way um, to to get ballot boxes so that they can under arm? Um, uh, no one wants to do that. And that is what we're seeing. It's becoming more and more prevalent that it's a, it's a man's world. Thank you, Ruth. Um, I'm going to open it up and and hopefully can just wave at me if they, they would like to speak. Um, and truly, comments are welcome or questions directed to any of our panelists. I would just ask that you turn on your microphone so people online can hear you uh, and introduce yourself briefly before speaking. Um, and we'll start right over here. Hi, I'm uh, Tim Robinson. I've worked in PNG for about uh, eight years as an advisor to the last three treasurers. Um, including now Minister Lynn Stuckey and uh, Secretary Oake. Um, just one quick comment and a question. Ruth's absolutely right. In the days following, it was really unclear what had happened. What it looks like now in hindsight is that a temporary threshold increase for the tax threshold, the tax-free threshold that was increased um, in 2023 to 20,000 kina wasn't implemented in the system, even though it was passed in the budget to then be made permanent and continue on an ongoing basis into future years. 
that threshold wasn't implemented in the Alesco tax system, and so the threshold defaulted back down to either 17,500 or 12,500. It's still a little unclear which, which then led to a big increase in people's tax payment. Um, I really like all the comments about policing, which I think is where a big part of this comes in. And, and there's been a, a bad tendency, I think, to other PNG, especially with things like this happening. And I, I think if we looked at it objectively, if the police said they weren't going to enforce laws in Washington, D.C. tomorrow, people here would loot. I, I would go to Target and loot. It's, you know, it's, it would happen in any country in the world. But... Something weird did happen on January 10th that hadn't happened before. I think even, even in the time I've worked in PNG, payrolls have been missed back in 2017, 2018. Payrolls slipped by a few days, and it didn't lead to this level of chaos or this level of out, uh, outbreak. In 2018, during APEC, the police weren't paid allowances, and they broke into parliament, but they didn't go on strike. And, and I guess this is kind of a question to all three panelists, but what do you think... What do you think made the situation so much worse this time? And what do you think led the police to kind of scale up their reaction to actually essentially going on strike and saying they wouldn't enforce laws when they hadn't even done that during the allowance issue during APEC? Thank you very much. And Gupla looking you to Start with either Ruth or Zuabe. Why, why, why this time, not last time? Team Gupla looking you too. Uh, morning, Loyu. I think what happened that I would um, pinpoint down to is the buildup of the political instability and the resentment with people. Um, things went in 2018, there was so much hope. 2017, 2018, people were looking at their life uh, as in it could get better. It could get, um, you know, there could be something that would make our lives better. But the the downward trend of basic services to um, the inflation that was happening to the point that the money that people were receiving was not enough to sustain them. This is something that um, you could see happening that led to this. There was so much dissatisfaction. There was so much um, even no, no trust in the leadership that we have in the country. We've had fuel short shortages that have led to um, airstrikes. We've le led to a lot of things that it was a buildup. Uh, the frustration that we, we felt in the past wasn't as bad as what is now the, the, the feeling, the general feeling around not only Port Moresby, but the rest of the country. It's like fe people don't feel their government where it really should be um, felt. So the build up to the point that the frustration wasn't able to, or people just went out on, on that's, that's my take on it. It was people were fed up to the point that they just wanted to um, destroy what little was left of what they call the state. Gordon, why don't you jump in and then I'll sort of ask, a, ask it a slightly different way for Zuhabe. Great. Um, I mean, I, I endorse everything that, that, that Ruth said and this sort of build up. And I mean, it was the sort of sense of a kind of a, 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 a watched pot sort of boiling over um, as well. I've got lots of friends and, and family in, in Papua New Guinea. And I look at the challenges that everyone has in living kind of normal, you know, quote unquote, normal, normal lives where even sort of people in the middle class are really struggling, uh, struggling to get to get to get by and this sort of sense that of, of sort of endless frustration as well. I think riots are, are the riots are also interesting. What's interesting about this, we don't actually, t um, well, the real reason why we ha wanted to have this event was we wanted to actually remember back on it because we as a tendency we all as human beings have a tendency to think ahead it's really striking how little there's coverage there has been about this this incident um in in the in the months since when james marape the prime minister of papua new guinea went to canberra it was not mentioned at all i mean partially that's for reasons of kind of diplomatise but also it's interesting that it's not you know not mentioned as well and Papua New Guinea is, is, as Ruth and Zwabi said, this has happened before. It's also happened in Solomon Islands in, in, uh, in 2022. It happened in Tonga in 2006. And I think these riots, which are kind of just outbursts of you know, frustration with the way by which the state, whether that be the state in Papua New Guinea, the state in Solomon Islands, and the state of Tonga, is 
is run is something that's really worthy of sort of unpacking and thinking thinking more about in terms of fragility. There's a, a colleague of ours um, who's been doing a terrific set of research projects on 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 Solomon Islands called Anouk Ride, and she's written and, and, and th thought more deeply than I have about what do riots signify um, as well. And it's really striking, I think, that we should, you know, I think it's an opportunity, and I think this is, this is one opportunity to kind of reflect uh, on that because it's a whole complex of different, of different issues, and unless we kind of unpack those issues, and we've sort of d done it like lousy policing is one, but kind of cost of living, lack of hope, um, is um, is is really worth doing. I, Brian was sort of right. I mean, it was a quite a sort of um, full-throated piece I wrote, but I wrote it because I was really upset, and I wrote it that uh, the morning that I of the off the riots, a friend of mine's niece had committed suicide. And she committed suicide because of her kind of complete lack of faith in, in sort of the fact that tomorrow would be any better than it was today. And there's just a general sort of malaise and hopelessness, I think, in large parts of Papua New Guinea that this, uh, and I channeled my sort of annoyance about that into the piece, but I think that there's a general malaise. And I think it's worth sort of anyone who wants to sort of help or, you know, in to assist to kind of reflect on what that and what that is. I mean, why is it, why is Port Moresby a city where most people in this room can't walk the streets? What does that say about the sort of everyday state that there is? Zuabe, you, you brought us the relatively good news story that, that things weren't as bad as they could have been. Um, and, I, and I sort of spoke for you a little bit, but I'm, I'm hoping you just take this opportunity to share a little bit more about the communities you work in and maybe some of the more specific stories of. Of, of who didn't get involved, um, who might have otherwise. Thank you. Um, let me go back to what Rudy um, responded with. Um, generally, um, the political leadership in the country is um, quite bad compared to the previous years, like 15, 20 years ago. Um, what I've noticed was um, like poor attention to the workforce, the government workforce, and there's um, also there's no attention to the people in the community. And through our work with the male behavior change training program that we are having with um, the young youths in the settlement and the community, um, people from the community express that there's hardly services from the government getting right into the community. The health centers do not have um, drugs to treat patients. Um, the schools are totally in disorder. Um, teachers are accepting bribes or admitting students. And generally the programs that the government's supposed to be implementing to deliver service to the community is quite, um, the services are not getting there. They are not provided as before with uh, enough um, equipment and you know, workforce to bring the services into the community. So with that, I was expecting you know, people to react with the situation that um, happened recently. The youths could have, you know, get on the road and you know, make their way up to the town and destroy all the shops out there. But um, I believe with the, the program that we, we, we are running now for a year now, we started with the you know, youths from the settlement, those who usually lead in um, instigating violence and also lead in you know, um, riots and protests and all this before. We, we've um, worked closely with them and their leaders. We've organized them um, into the youth groups and we are working through the, the association, youth community-based organization and the youth associations to reach out to the the members of the youths in the community with information, um, appropriate in information around human rights and the laws and how they can um, improve themselves and increase um, productivity in the community because the government is not available now to assist them wherever they are. So um, I believe um, they have gotten enough information from, uh, um, from USIP work here in uh, Morabe province. We've um, reached out to almost like three quarters of the 
the settlement, which is outside of the city. That's where bulk of the population are living. And that's where most of the violence and conflict that happens in the in, in Morobe province. So we've covered those areas. So kind of um, kept those youths in the right sense not to do what might get them into trouble, unnecessary trouble, like before. So most of them said, why would we put our life online for nothing? It doesn't concern us. So that was like, I respond that I didn't expect to get from them because they were always, you know, looking out for opportunities to to get what they they need to satisfy their, you know, basic needs in life. But they didn't do that um, in the last um, the last month that the um, incident occurred. So yeah, I feel there's something going on with our program here in Morobe Province. And it's, it's it's having some positive impact, especially on the targeted groups that we, we really want to work with and change the attitude around violence. So this might be, I'm, I'm just believing that this might be one of the outcome of our, our program here in Morobe. Thanks, and I, I would encourage anybody interested in, in learning more to go to usip.org we have a produced a 10 or 12 minute video of zuabe working in the community with these leaders um sort of brings it all to life a bit um who's next uh, matt why don't you introduce yourself hi uh matt hudson with the uh, department of state cso pacific team um so one thing uh, i've noted in the time i've covered papua new guinea is uh a lot of things come to quick ends when, when, I, I, and that's kind of part of my question. So, Ruth, you'd mentioned the the lack of a, the state uh, during the riots, and Zwabe, you mentioned the next day things were kind of back to normal. So, my question is, if if it's not the police uh, or effective policing bringing these riots to an end, how or why do they end? Whoever wants to jump in first. Hi, Matt. Um, thank you for your question. And I think that's a very good question. Um, I would also like to know why. <laughs> because I feel it might have some tribal um, cultural, uh, depending on where these communities are. Let me give you a contrast of what happened. Now, in the cities were the ones that the riots happened. In the other 22 centers around the country, no one touched anything apart from only one province up in the highlands, one of the newer province, Jiwaka, which capital has a um, conflict around where it's supposed to be by the tribal leaders around the, 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 the town. It's a town, it's not a city. But in other towns around this, uh, um, the, the country, other centers around the country, it was the people the tribal, the, the the tribal or indigenous people that own the land on which the town or the city sat were the ones that actually uh, protected the city, the ones that walked the streets, the ones that um, stood with the police to say that no one touches any buildings, no one touch, touches a school, no one's going to do that. Um, in towns like Mount Hagen, which is the third largest city, it was the tribes that surround the city were the ones that actually came into the city and basically took over saying that no one, and they were picking up rubbish, they were cleaning up their city. And it happened also in uh, many in Southern Islands and in other parts um, in Enga, um, exactly the same thing, business as normal. It was the two main cities uh, which were, has had all the government um, departments that um, had all the business houses. Um, Lei is the, the, the economic capital of PNG and the port city of PNG. And of course, Port Mosby is our, um, where the parliament house is. Those were the two, two um, centers or the cities that had the rioting. Everyone else, it was business as normal for them. So good question. Um, it stopped because there was, I, I think there was no support from the others. Um, majority of the people that live in Ley and um, Port Mosby, you have the huge or biggest uh, population of settlers. Uh, people that come into cities and towns and squat on uh, government land uh, in uh, looking for a better life for themselves, better access to health, education for their children. But a lot of them squat on land that does not belong to them. So they build little shanty towns. Um, and those were, and, and not only them, they were, I mean, when people looted, everyone looted, but you have a large number of settlers in those two, two 
centers. Now, people are not pushing to have the Vacancy um, Act passed uh, so that people that do not have any work and are not um, engaged in any formal employment should be sent back to their own provinces. Uh, but then in the provinces where majority of these towns are, nothing happened. People went to school, went to work, and it was business as normal. It was only one or two incidents where opportunists started blocking the highway and all that. But um, like I said, um, th those were the only two uh, centers that had disturbance. For others, people tried, but it didn't get anything beyond um, amassing. They got quick, quickly dispersed by security or the police. And yeah, like I said, it was business as normal. I don't know if I'm answering your question. <laughs> Zuabe, do you want to jump in, or Gordon? Let me uh, respond from us in Morobe. Um, with Lay City, we have a very good supportive um, MP, and he's the Deputy Prime Minister at the moment. Um, he's got a very re good relationship with the the like the public servants, not gen not the public servants only, but um, especially the police. And um, he, he, he had a program, he has a program that um, engages the youth to kind of um, clean around the bus stops and around the city areas, the drains and all this, and keep the city clean, and also help to um, control petty crimes at the bus stop where women get harassed and the bags get snatched. So, there is a program that's running that he's running at the moment that's um, engaging youth as well as the youth supporting the police in managing the towns and cities, especially the bus stop where a lot of um, violence against women happen. So um, when that um, situation arose, um, the youths that were around that that those areas they they kind of supported the police in you know controlling the situation in the town. So they were speaking to their peers not to do what uh, what is not right. Yeah, so I believe for Morro Bay, it was, I think we had some very good programs on the ground that already, like the MP is supporting and, and um, it's already like happening for almost like more than five years now. So um, that might be the outcome of um, what we didn't, um, see going from um, bed to west. Gordon, did you want or no, let's uh, let's go to an online question. Yes, yeah, so we have a comment online saying there is a domino effect across the country, and social media played an important role in this domino effect. The riots and looting emanated as a result of this disruptive effects of integrating into a digital economy in PNG. Um, so there's no question here, but maybe curious to hear thoughts on how cybersecurity needs to be upgraded to curb new threats, and any thoughts on kind of the role of social media. Who wants to jump in? Yeah, I mean, I, I can I can tough jump in. It's a it's a you know it's a comment as a a question. I mean. Like all of us, a lot of Papua New Guinea spend a lot of time on, on, on social media and are getting information from you know, WhatsApp, from Facebook, from, from you know, YouTube. And I think it's an underexplored territory as to what the role of social media is in terms of either giving negative messages or giving kind of positive messages. Um, there's a concept in political science which is a, called the jumping scale, and it means that with things that used to be able to happen isolated out in the in place X would never really filter into the capital city. But actually because of social media and because of how interconnected we all are, things that could happen previously in isolation have these kind of ramifying ripple ripple effects. Um, and I think it is something that's sort of worthy, uh, worthy of examination. I wake up most days to, a, and I'm sure Zwabe and Ruth wake up to many more of them to like, tens of videos of some of which is pretty, are pretty horrendous of the of the violence that actually is going on in, in Papua New Guinea that is less headline grabbing than this but is the kind of everyday uh, violence that punctuates and permeates um, so many lives so I think it's something that is worthy of 
further examination. And I'll just give a plug to, Brian mentioned the NRI um, researchers. We're doing a very small research project at, at USIP that is actually looking exactly at, the, at this issue and trying to get at what can we discern and what can we learn from, uh, from social media usage? Can it be used to dampen things or can it be used to uh, in, inflame things? And we're really, I think, into uncharted territory uh, with it. And I think it's something worth, worth thinking about and reflecting on. And I thank the, the commenter for, for their question. Um, got a Drew pad. I saw his hand up, then Andrew, and then over there. Hi, my name is Drew Podnag. I'm with the Department of State Desk Officer for Papua New Guinea. Um, so I think the timing of this is very interesting um, because it came ahead of the the grace period on the vote of no confidence. I think some people, I mean, I think explicitly folks in the government have said, you know, that was a bit of suspicious timing. Um, but, you know, in the weeks after the rioting, um, Prime Minister Marape was not particularly concerned um, at how these riots might affect his ability to stay in power. And in fact, he, he left the country to go to Canberra and address the parliament where he was, you know, the first Pacific leader to ever address the, the Australian parliament. Um, and so in talking and thinking about the sort of divorce between what's happening kind of at the, the local level with the desperation people are feeling and sort of at the elite level, I think Prime Minister Marape has, over the last couple of years, really raised his regional profile. Um, so I guess my question here is, you know, if there is no outlet for people um, within the political system, and it seems like, you know, from what we're seeing on open source, um, you know, Prime Minister Marape still has a pretty solid political coalition, doesn't necessarily look like it's likely that he'd be removed. Um, you know, where do we go from here? I, I mean, are these riots going to become sort of a, a regular feature? Um, in the months and years moving forward? Um, or is there some other sort of way um, where there can be some accountability for the government? Um, yeah, thank you. Ruth, do you want to take this, how it intersects with politics? Uh, Drew, thank you for your question. It's interesting. It's interesting how there is a disconnect um, from the elite and um, the people that are feeling the real pinch of um, of trying to make a living, um, and to uh, not to take away anything from what um, uh, there may be some politicians are trying to do to alleviate um, um, the economic burden that that their people are feeling. It's it's been building up for some time. We've been on a decline uh, in the last two two decades, three decades or so. Um, education system has failed. Our health systems have failed. Um, the lawlessness that has arisen. I work in the space of sorcery accusation related violence, uh, and which is a direct result of the health system. People need to blame someone for the death of um, unexpected deaths, life uh, deaths relating to um, lifestyle of people. But then at the same time, it's because hospitals do not have enough medication. Uh, we don't have doctors that are able to use uh, medical equipment, probably lack of it. And so um, you have huge catchment area of people with one hospital serving them, 25,000, 20,000, uh, without one hospital. But then people die from curable diseases. So, of course, people are becoming more and more um, dissatisfied with the way they see their government now. Uh, your view might not necessarily be my view. Whereas you, um, when you want to call an ambulance, it's just 911, the police or the ambulance or whoever you need. It's just a phone call away. Some, some of our people have to walk days to get to the nearest road to make it to the nearest hospital. So the dissatisfaction has, has, has been there for a very long time. Um, and to now to see that becoming wider and wider, um, to be able to really decide where would be the tipping point, whether or not we've reached the needle where it tips over or whether or not we've we've come to a point where people will say that, you know what, this is my lot in life. So I'll just go on. The rich can keep getting richer. Um, I will go back to my land, till my land, and basically, you know, this is what I do. But you can also see that the buildup of arms and the way that um, the elites are starting to 
to secure themselves through all kinds of means is also portraying a state that is becoming criminal. Because we have a lot of gaps there, it's just showing up in every turn uh, that we don't have what you would call normally call a state, as a, a police system that barely function, a L system that doesn't even function at all. Likewise with education, other infrastructure. So when we talk about state and if we have one, it barely functions. So of course, when you are looking at um, a prime minister that doesn't care because he knows um, you can use a state if the state is there, but if the state is not there, uh, then of course, you know exactly how to meander through that and be confident in the fact that you can still be in power and not care what the people on the ground are feeling. So whether or not we reach the tipping point and the needle has been pushed, uh, that I can really say for certain, if we're gonna have more riots or people will say that, you know what, I'll just, I'll just deal with it as it is. Thanks. Hi, everyone. My name is Andrew Harding. I'm with the Heritage Foundation's Asian Studies Center, leading our Pacific Island works. Um, two questions that are adjacent to one another. First, over to Ruth, in your opening remarks, you you mentioned that some re some restaurants or businesses weren't looted and specifically said that it, were, it was the Chinese shops that weren't looted because they were protected by gunmen. Uh, I have a hunch that wasn't by chance, but I'm curious if you could just elaborate a little more about um, these Chinese shops and as to how these gunmen came to protect them versus others. So just elaborate, I appreciate some elaboration on that remark. And then more broadly to the panel, uh, if we could dive in a little more to Chinese activities throughout Papua New Guinea that may be standing out and where that seems like there's some security conversations that are now developing with PNG in China. Um, so if those two questions adjacent to one another would be great to get answers on that. Thanks. Yeah, great. Um, Ruth, why don't we start with the, the you know, this more specific issue um, of the, the Chinese shops and, and who are these, these you know, quote unquote Chinese and, and what are the dynamics there? And then maybe Gordon, some, some thoughts on this um, security arrangement and, and other issues. So Ruth. Uh, thank you, Brian. Thank you, Andrew, for your question. Um, so we've seen a lot um, of, of new Chinese versus old Chinese. Uh, we've always had Chinese in the um, Chinese towns in Papua New Guinea. We've got members of parliament that uh, um, makes Chinese. We've we've had Chinese businesses in the country that have put in a lot of development um, into what we now have um, a, a country. But then we've had a late influx of um, uh, Asian business people that have come into the country. Um, some of those business houses were not even touched and they are on the periphery on this, of the city where they're very, very near um, settlements. A lot of them have what you call a, a shops that um, they call them lots. So it's either lot 22 or lot 60 where you have um, 10 or 20 shops facing each other. Now, most of these shops have what everyday people need because a lot of them are, are very cheap. They go at a cheap price. And again, it's on the periphery of the city. So people would easily have, have access to it. Not even one of them was touched. Not even one of them was burned uh, uh, to the ground like the other shops within the city center. Um, and that brought a lot of questions of how could these shops be not I asked around for a few people, why couldn't um, these shops were touched? Why didn't you to the young men that were robbing shops, to the women. And they, they were like, do you want us to be shot dead? Because they had people standing on the rooftops with guns. And some of them were foreigners. I mean, not some, most, most of them were foreigners. And they were st standing at the rooftops of their building with guns. Now, whether or not um, some of these guns were registered, we don't know. Whether or not um, they were um, guns that were issued, um, by security firms, we don't know. All we know was that these are the shops that were not touched. And these are the shops that could have easily been accessed and easily been um, touched. So of course, um, there is that undertone around the city that there are certain shops in Moresby, we know that you cannot be able to touch them. And and, um, and a lot of them are, really, um, are linked to this new influx of um, Chinese that have been coming into the, and Asians as well, that have been coming into the city and building up, putting up their shops. Now we've got the old Chinese that have been 
always been around in the country. Some of them got looted, uh, but not the new ones. Zuabe, so, anything you can share um, in lay? Um, just sort of on these general dynamics and, and where is China? I mean, this is, this is you know, one of, it's, it's no secret. One of, the, one of the reasons why Washington is more and more focused on Papua New Guinea and Pacific Islands region generally is because of competition with China, right? So sketch out where China is or, or isn't um, in Morobe province. Thank you. Um, from what I'm observing here in Morobe, um, the Chinese have, they're already in the communities. They're with the people right at the peripheral of the city and right at the peripheral of the community. Uh, most of the shops that Papua New Guineans own are rented out by Asians, not just um, Chinese, but Indians as well. And they they have very good relationship with the community members. They employ them, and some of them are engaged in their kind of um, informal sales of the products, like carrying t-shirts on the street or um, earpiece, mobile phone earpiece, and speakers on the like they they take them out on the street and do street sales. So that's how um, some of the ways that the Asians are doing in in um, doing business here in Morobe province. So they, they're kind of, um, they've mixed well with the community and they're doing their business using the community. So um, I think because of that relationship, maybe one of the reason might be because of the relationship, the good relationship that they have with the community had um, kind of protected them and their businesses. Um, second, they also kind of um, provide support to the police forces. And in, in such situation, like what had occurred, they, they provide food and funds to the police. So they, they are around them or near them to provide that um, security that they need. So that's, um, that's with Morobe province. The Asians are already in the communities and they're living with the people there are some intermarriages already happening there and the business are kind of, they've got them involved in their business. So that had kind of secured them to be there in the community and doing business. Um, Gordon, could you sort of unpack some of these observations and then sort of lay on the geopolitics and policing and PRC elements to it? Sure. Um, <laughs> And I, I, I think the, the, the I'll begin by just sort of reinforcing the the reflections of my colleagues from from Papua New Guinea, because I think they're really important reflections. And the the, the point that Zwabe made about kind of first mover advantage that comes with with being in you know being and how well integrated uh, Chinese communities are in Papua New Guinea. I lived in Bougainville, as Brian said, for for three years, and I remember I had a really enlightening conversation with. Uh, the owner of one of the kind of fried chicken restaurants in uh, in Buka, and he made the it point. It features prominently in, in Gordon's book. It features prominently in my my in my book. It's well worth visiting once. Um, but he said he sort of said he said sort of words to the fact that he said you'll be here for a few years, but we're gonna we you know you know we're traders and we you know when we come to Bougainville we'll we'll be here for a kind of long time. And I think that's sort of worth reflecting on, and just in terms of the kind of relationality of this, this, this place where people aren't perceived as states like China or the United States, they're perceived as people. And I think you know, the, the, the tenure of communities, uh, people in these communities is really important. And, is, as, uh, and what, what Zwabe was talking about in, in Morobe is definitely true in Bougainville in terms of sort of you know, marriages into communities. And what, and what happens when you marry into a community, you get access to land um, as well. The wider kind of geopolitical point that you alluded to, about a month ago, the foreign minister of Papua New Guinea, Justin Chachenko, was in Beijing, and he sort of made a sort of an announcement that was a sort of trial balloon or a, or a way to get attention or a serious thing. It was hard to, to know that, 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 Papua New, that China had offered Papua New Guinea assistance after, after the riots, and that got everyone frothy. You know about what it could what it could could mean, and it's very similar to 
to what happened in Solomon Islands after the riots, very similar sort of style of, of, of doing it. And we focus on the kind of you know, Chinese playbook in a way, but there's also a, 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 an elite playbook here as well within the Papua New Guinean elite, which is if you mention, Ch if you mention the C word, you know that you're gonna get more attention uh, from Australia or from the United States. So it's a kind of it's a known button that you can, that you can press. And I think that's sort of worth sort of ref ref reflecting on. I also, we wrote a piece on, on this and we said it's, it's, it's important not to downplay this sort of the Chinese sort of rule. I mean, they're, they were in, so in Solomon Islands. Um, there's an extra territorial policing component um, in, the, uh, which in, in Solomon Islands as well. But it's also important not to downplay the, the and by extra territorial policing, I mean, Chinese state officials rounding people up and putting them on planes bound, bound back for, for Beijing has happened in Vanuatu. But there's also a kind of Pacific part of the equation too that we need to kind of think about um, as, as well. And one of the sort of Pacific parts of the equation, and I think it, it kind of gets to the point that I made earlier, Andrew, that's hard to kind of use words like the state or you know, the, the Chinese, when you're actually sort of talking about people, is a story that was told in the um, Relayed in the organized crime and cr organized crime corruption reporting project that had, did this sort of fascinating story that I think showed the multi kind of threaded connections um, that relate to poor governance, relate to kind of elite linkages, and relate to business interests, um, whether they be from you know China or from Australia or from or your sort of one of the sort of Chinese that's been here for a long time that Ruth and, and Zwabe went to. And these stories all kind of have a similar sort of thread to them. They, they, they relate to a kind of large scale infrastructure project, sort of money going missing, you know, some, something happening, met, you know, an arrest, and then nothing. You know, a sort of thundering denial by a politician, and then sort of a, a sense to do to do something, and I think it's sort of all these instances um, point, I think, to the a kind of weak underbelly of of uh, of sort of policing and authority in Papua New Guinea, and point to things I think that you know we in the United States could think about, and we you know we anyone who's kind of interested in thinking about these these issues could think about. And one obvious one would be to look at the financial system that, um, that, uh, and where money flows in and, in and, in and out of uh, Papua New Guinea. I mean, the, the, there's people much more qualified than I to talk about that, but that should give you a pretty good indication about where money is flowing in and, flo and flowing out. Final point I'll make, and I think it's sort of something worth noting for everyone in the audience and for everyone um, watching online, is that there's something called a mutual evaluation that is taking place at the minute, which is an assessment of Papua New Guinea's uh, anti-money laundering um, abilities and the extent to which they've, they're kind of doing what they're expected to do on that. I think that those reports are often quite revealing of, of levels of, of interest and also offer quite good roadmaps for what you can actually do about it. Um, do about it as, as well, and I think it's some. It's one of the kind of tools in the, in the in the financial system at, that that United States plays a large role in. That we could, you know, actively think more about. It's a tool that's at, at disposal uh, as well. Okay, our time is marching down very very quickly, so I'm going to have Megan read out one online question and one question over here and one last question over there, uh, and then our panel will get um, a last word. Yeah, so we have a question on policing assistance. Um, the governor of Anga province has repeatedly called for Australian federal police to, de to be deployed on the ground there. What does that say about how the AFP is perceived in policing more broadly? And then there's a similar question that's asking about the announcement two days ago that 20 police from Commonwealth countries would be deployed to PNG. Um, giving past policing assistance, how effective do you think that strategy is? Okay, and let's just grab all, all the questions at once. Uh, so my name is Rowan Travis. I'm also from State CSO. Uh, my question is related to, uh, you've kind of uh, shown this progression from dissatisfaction to violence uh, and then 
the violence causing more uh, dissatisfaction and just seeing what other inflection points, especially in the areas you were talking about, education, medicine, fuel shortages, uh, that we might see in the next six, eight, nine months um, causing more of these uh, newsworthy levels of violence in the future. Great. Finally. Lauren Sauer, International Foundation for Electoral Systems. So I have two questions. One is, what do you see as the priority investments for stability, um, given the discussions of whether it's policing, whether it's more peace, peace kind of interventions, and what kind of incentives will do elites need in order to finally deliver services for citizens? Okay, all great questions. Um, let's go to each of our panelists and hopefully in some combination, everybody will have addressed all of them. So we'll go with Ruth, Zuabe, and, and, and Gordon. Ruth? Certainly the, the question of anger, um, you know, for you. So the governor of Enga has been um, for quite some time asking for the intervention of the Australian Federal Police now. In the wake of the violence last week, um, this is the his call has been going on for some time since last year before that, uh, but not not after the violence um, on Sunday. He's calling for AFP was basically around um, uh, the governance of police. Um, we to work with police on um, good police morale boosting. We've not at police training after they go to the the academy, the police academy. A lot of the policemen that we have in the country right now um, have not gone for further training after their first. Uh, uh, and some of them have been in the force for thirty years. Some of them have been in the force for. 20 years, 10 years. Now, this is a, a country with a um, high threshold for violence. So you're, you're, you have policemen that are exposed to violence over and over. So their discipline now becomes a problem again. Uh, Gordon, you made this statement about um, uh, our police commissioner making a statement about policemen are criminals in uniforms. Now, it's, it's not that, it's just that their behavior is. Now, this is a police force that has the worst ratio in the, in the world. Uh, you said, 10 million Papua New Guineans. Well, UN said we've got 17 million Papua New Guineans. So let's do the math. You have 6,000 policemen that is policing 17 million uh, people. But of the 6,000 policemen, uh, one th two thirds of those policemen are desk police officers past retirement age. So you've got one third of those 6,000 are actually active duty policemen. So you can just imagine how hard it is for 2,000 policemen to police 17 million Papua New Guineans. So having the AFP over is not going to do anything. If anything, it's actually going to make it worse because you have tribal people that will see foreigners encroaching on their land. So sending AFP up to Enga is not going to solve the problem. If this problem actually has to be dealt by Papua New Guineans in Papua New Guinea, fix the state, um, the law and order issue that we already have here. Um, I think there was another question around um, the violence that how can we be able to curb this? Uh, and one of the things, I think it came from someone from the electoral. Um, so one of the things that we can fix this is getting people elected into parliament uh, through demo democratic means. Not having people that have used up the power of the people using violence and guns because then people are not going to respect whoever the member of parliament is. So fix the electoral system. We don't have an electoral system in place that people can go and vote. Uh, we don't have even the um, census, our census updated. So right now, the members of parliament have the power to actually boost the numbers in their own electorate. So if they want to boost the numbers in a certain place that they know that they have supporters, they can do that. So you would have 10,000 people in the support base of those members of parliament. Now, if we have a good census where every Papua New Guinea is actually in the census, they could easily be able to vote people in. Maybe there might be one of the things that... Um, could end the violence. And overalling the system, lastly, overalling the old system, this is, uh, like I said, a state that has problems and there is as loopholes everywhere. So a overall of the police system could be a fair start into how we can be able to address this. But otherwise it's the old state, the old statehood. There is no state. Zuabe, a minute of last thoughts.
I'll just respond to um, the AFP police here in Papua New Guinea. Um, from what I'm seeing and previously working with them, they are mostly focused on administrative matters and capacity building of police. So um, they have their like kind of targeted provinces that they work in. So I believe they have a program under JSS 40 for ENGA. And um, I don't know if that contract have ended or not, but um, in Morobe, they, they provided support to the police and it's mostly capacity building and administrative support. So um, what, what I think about the police is um, if we can increase the number of um, kind of trained police and get them recruited in the system, that is one thing that's very challenging, especially with recruitment with all, nearly all public servants in the country. We have a lot of need here, but the government's capacity in in um, bringing in public servants into you know various sectors to um, implement is um, kind of quite challenging for our government at the moment. Yeah, so um, I think that's what the police are experiencing. And another thing is um, the training that the police receive. It's, only for six months, and I feel that is not enough. I did have some um, opportunity to speak with the AFP, um, the team leaders here in Morobe, and I said, why don't we give them some chances to, you know, maybe take them overseas and they see for some few, three, four weeks or one month, and let them see how policies, uh, police overseas are kind of doing their work, so they can come back with that experience and see if they can improve their performance here in Papua New Guinea. So give them some outside exposure on how you know countries that have good practices in policy, so um, they can come back with those experiences and try improve here. So that's um, that's my perception around how we could improve policing here in Papua New Guinea. Gordon. And um, oh, with the, oh sorry, go ahead, Zora. Sorry, um, with the um, electoral system. I feel it will be more just if um, if we could have this um, electoral um, electronic system for voting, so people can vote through that, so they are not manipulated in their decisions in voting. And that, for me, I see it's kind of a mile a mile away for us to achieve. Our senses are not updated like in the last ten years, maybe, and and. The systems like the electronic system cannot. I mean, it's a challenge for the electoral commission to have it. Okay, we might have finally have a frozen connection. Um, I think we did really well, Gordon. Uh, thoughts. So, <laughs> the sort of crystal ball saying question. I mean, it's a really important question. It's you know, it's hard to predict. So, if we got to the people to give them a fair go in elect. We still have a long way to improve on that problem that we are seeing now, especially with election really in choosing the leaders. I'll, I'll, um, the, the, I mean, what was announced yesterday in Papua New Guinea was that Puma, which is the major fuel provider in Papua New Guinea, isn't going to wind up its operations. Um, in it's like three or four months ago, this happened. There was a, a sort of a consternation and like what we would all have it, we couldn't put fuel in our in our vehicles and some of those knock-on effects that, that Ruth was talking about I mean the it didn't raise the temperature right over to boiling point but that seems an, an obvious thing to um, to address uh, the incentives thing I, I think the electoral system is something I think the electoral system and the census are what, what are donors good at they're good at do, they're do, they're good at doing technical things that are divorced sort of from maybe from the from the politics of it and the census seems an obvious thing to focus on, and the fact that we all know that there's going to be an election in 2027, that's not in dispute. Um, that's something that sort of really gets on. And in terms of your question of incentives, I think that gets into the question of elites. Uh, there's, a, there's a book that, uh, that I read recently called Gambling for Development. It basically looked at, like, why do certain countries constitute, quote-unquote, development successes, and others do not? And the answer 
that the author came up with was that the elites had an interest in doing that, and that's not something that we, you know, outsiders can, um, you know, can address. But I think technical things like the census that Ruth was talking about, the the uh, electoral system, the fact that fi like nearly fifty percent of Papua Guineans were disenfranchised in the last election, and there was a, a terrific piece written by Terence Wood, who's a Cephologist, is that what an electoral specialist wrote on the um, on the uh, USIP website that I really encourage everyone to go and take a look at. Great, thank you, Ruth, Zuabe, Gordon. Um, you know, clearly Washington is more focused on Papua New Guinea than at any time in, in recent memory. We're doing trying to do our small part uh, with work in the country, but also using our, our incredible staff there to connect and, and, and bring a little more knowledge to Washington. So really happy that we did this. This was a little bit of an experiment. Uh, if we could just have our own staff, um, you know, us calling the meeting and hopefully a few people would show up and en enough people did. So we'll be, we'll be sure to do it again. So thank you so much for, for joining us.